Did, did you hear about the, the fishermen that went fishing over at Little Pigeon River in the Great Smoky Mountains? And while he was there fishing, there was another guy who was a traveler that just happened to be observing this fisherman, and he was taking notice of him for over an hour. And he never caught anything. There was no obvious signs of uh, any kind of activity. So the traveler goes over to the fisherman and says, Sir, it doesn't look like there's any fish over here in this stream. The old fisherman looked at him and says, Nope, there ain't any here. The visitor said, Well, what's the object of fishing if you know there's not any fish here? To which the fisherman's reply was, It's to show my wife that I have no time to peel potatoes and break beans. Well, I say that to say, where we are today in life, in the ministry of the church, there's plenty of fish out there. And we don't have to worry about going someplace where, well, there's not even fish over there in that stream. There's fish everywhere. Now, if you recall, last Sunday, I started a series of sermons on deep soul fishing. And we're looking at our responsibility as fishermen reaching the fish out there in the community. How are we going to do that? What's the method? What's the methodology there that we need to be using and exercising to catch those fish? Deep soul fishing. I'm not sure how long this series is going to go. Uh, it's probably not going to be a long series, but I say three or four anyway. So I've got a couple more at least. But I would like to close out this series on talking about the soul. What is the soul? Where does that soul abide? Does it go anywhere after death? Does something happen to the soul? I was driving down the road, and I heard a segment of Billy Graham here a few months ago. It was just about a five-minute segment. He was talking about the soul. I thought, wow, I don't know that I've ever heard a sermon on the soul. So I want to develop that, and I'm going to close out, since we're talking about deep soul fishing, we need to understand how important the soul of man really is. I've entitled this sermon today, The Lord Needs More Fishing Bass. Now, some of us know something about fishing. I know that, Marshall, you do an awful lot of fishing. We had your brother Jerry in the 9 o'clock service today. And then Jason, you certainly know a lot about fishing. In fact, if you don't know, Jason teaches a class or classes on fishing at the Grant County High School. I might need to take a lesson or two, okay? All right? But now, some of you know something about fishing. All of us know a little bit more about fishing than perhaps I do. But I'll remind you of a point that I made last Sunday. When a person becomes a follower of Jesus Christ, when a person becomes a Christian, he or she becomes a part of the bride of Christ, the church. So we are all a part of that bride. And God has given us the Great Commission. If you know anything about the Great Commission, you know that that comes from the very last chapter in the very first book of the New Testament, Matthew, the 28th chapter. And it is there that Jesus commissions us. And I think we can carry that out and use a stronger word and commands us as Christians to go out and make disciples to go out and catch fish, all kinds of fish, all kinds of people. In other words, our obligation here is to go fishing, fishing for souls. You know, we're going to be able to spend eternity worshiping God. I don't know what all that's going to be like. I do believe that that will be the first time ever 
that I'll be able to sing, and I guess it'll be in tune for the first time. And if I'm not in tune in heaven, I don't think it's going to matter. But we'll spend eternity worshiping the Lord, praying, loving the Lord. I think we'll be learning about the Lord and learning what heaven is all about. But it is the here and now. It is right now. This is the time that we have to go out catching fish so that they too can be brought in and be able to spend eternity with us. See, every one of us, we're going to spend eternity somewhere. I just said that in a funeral here a few days ago. You may not want to talk about it, but avoid it all you want. The truth is, we're all going to spend eternity somewhere. There's only two choices, as I understand God's word. We're going to spend eternity in one of two places. And we are here on earth, I believe, a big part of our obligation, a big part of our responsibility as fishermen here at the Pleasant Ridge Baptist Fish Hatchery. We are here to try to get as many people as we can to spend eternity with us in heaven. Now, if you are a believer, and I'd be willing to venture that those that we've got here today, as far as I know, everyone here is a believer. Now, if you are a believer, it tells me that somebody went out there fishing for you. You were a fish at one time. It might have been a preacher. It might have been your parents. It might have been your grandparents. It might have been a Sunday school teacher. But somebody threw out a baited hook to you with the good news of Jesus Christ. You bit. And you went from being a fish to being developed into a fisher of men. In the first chapter of the Gospel of John, and that's where we are today, we're looking at another gospel uh, a different gospel than where we were last Sunday. But we read of some of the very first followers of Jesus Christ. Let's, let's look at uh, what I will call fishing buddies. These were Jesus' fishing buddies. And I think when you look at this passage here and you look at it, and I'm not going to be probing into every one of those this morning, but I have probed into every one of those verses uh, in, the, in this passage right here. And I think we get some clues as to what we really need to be doing if we are going to be buddying up with the Lord and being one of his fishing buddies. Let's look at verses 39. Let's go from 35 to 39. I think it's important that we involve ourselves. Involve is a key verb. Involve ourselves in developing relationships. The next day, again, John was standing with two of his disciples. And he looked at Jesus as he walked by and said, Behold, the Lamb of God. The two disciples heard him say this, and they followed. They heard him say this, and they followed Jesus. Jesus turned and saw them. He noticed that they were following him, and he said, What are you seeking? And they said to him, Rabbi, teacher, where are you staying? He goes from one question to asking another, Where are you staying? And he said to them, Come. And you will see. So they came and saw where he was staying. And they stayed with him that day. For it was about the tenth hour. See I see Jesus. Out here according to what scripture tells us here. He was out taking a walk. When he was spotted by John. And this happens to be John the Baptist here. John was publicly identifying him as the Lamb of God. This guy right here, he's the Messiah. He's the Son of God. He's the Lamb of God. Now, two of John's disciples hear him speak. And what happens? They begin to follow him. Now, actually, actually at this point, I see no indication anywhere other than all that they knew about Jesus 
is what they had heard. They had never spent any time with him. They had never personally got to know him, but curiosity, the curiosity peaked, and they wanted to know more about this Lamb of God. And then we see that Jesus turns to them, and he begins a conversation with them, and he's asking what I would call a very legitimate question. What are you seeking? In other words, what are you looking for? But they responded by saying, asking, where are you staying? Where are you staying? I see Jesus is taking this opportunity right here. He sees a door that is opening up, and it's giving him an opportunity to say, come. Come and see. Come and see where I'm staying. See, he could have very well told them where he was staying. Might have been there at the Holiday Inn Express there in Galilee uh, or Jerusalem here. Who knows? He could have answered their question and then just walked away and never said anything else. But I see something going on right here. I see Jesus wanting to do something. He is wanting to cultivate relationships with these two. He was willing to get involved in their lives. He was willing to find out exactly where they are on their spiritual realm, in that spiritual pilgrimage. I want to know a little bit more about you, he's thinking to himself. Uh, Who are you? I believe that Jesus was doing that in hopes that he could make a difference in their lives and that he could have an impact on their lives. Now, this is a picture I get when I read this. Jesus is involving himself into the lives of of two men specifically named right here. He's trying to cultivate that relationship. He's trying to lead them down a path of getting to know him and spending time with them on a personal level. Now, this is the lesson that I think I grab a hold of, and I hope you do too. If we're going to be fishing buddies out there, if we're going to link up with Jesus and be one of his fishing buddies, then we must learn to involve ourselves into the lives of others. Carry on a conversation. Get to know them personally. A survey from the Institute of American Church Growth tells us, and I think these are pretty accurate figures if uh, you want my opinion, said somewhere between 76 and 92% of new believers Come to Jesus Christ through a friend, an acquaintance, an established relationship who explained the good news to them on a one-to-one basis. I think those numbers are are, are pretty high. Now listen, the best fishermen out there, and I could probably single out a couple right here that would fall in that category. The best fishermen out there, they just don't go where the fish are. I've been where the fish are, and I still didn't catch anything. You've got to know the bait. You've got to know how to catch what you're looking for. Now, the connection that I see here is people, people will be most receptive to us. They'll be most receptive to our witness. They'll be most receptive to our walk, to our testimony, to our influence when there is an existing relationship. See, I think one of my things in talking, it's very difficult for me, I've shared this with you all, very difficult for me just to walk up to a stranger. Are you saved? If you died tonight, where would you go? See, I had that to happen to me as a child. And and I remember how that made me feel. I felt so intimidated. And that's not me. I'm not saying don't do that. I'm just saying that's not me. And the Southern Baptist Convention, my goodness, they'll go to uh, Las Vegas and all these places and have these witnessing people go out on the street and and, and talk to these people. That's good. But that's not my calling. I like to get to know people. I like to have an established relationship. That's just who I am. And I feel myself more effective in that area on a one-on-one basis here. 
Let's look at what's taking place here in verses 40 and 41 in this same chapter. One of the two who heard John speak and followed John was Andrew. Now, we told you last week that Andrew was what, Kent? He was Simon Peter's brother. He first found his own brother Simon. And he said to him, we have found the Messiah. We have found the Christ. All of those that have been prophesied in the law and in the Old Testament, we've now found him. See, Andrew went to one spot where he knew he could cultivate an already existing relationship. How many of you remember Cheers on TV? That uh, television sitcom. I say, I don't watch TV too much anymore. don't have a chance to do that. But I remember Cheers. I remember Friends. What about Frasier? Remember those? What about Seinfeld? Oh, I've got some friends that are Seinfeld. Uh, trivia experts. They know everything about who said what and what took place when. I, I never got into that that much. But there's something there about those popular television sitcoms. And yes, that took place several years ago, back when I was able to watch a little TV. But when I think about this, I have to ask the question, what is the glue that held every one of those sitcoms together and, and, and what they were doing? relationships, developing and cultivating relationships. All of them involved people who were willing to involve themselves in the lives of others. It's all about cultivating relationships. And when relationships are there, there's that connectivity. And there's that, that acceptance there. Cheers. I thought about maybe putting this on the screen, but Jesse, I didn't get to you early enough to do that, and I probably won't sing it quite as well as they would. But part of the lyrics in that theme song of Cheers says, Sometimes you want to go where everybody knows your name, and they're always glad you came. You want to be where you can see our troubles are all the same. You want to be where everybody knows your name. What's that saying? I think that is telling us, reminding us, that people want and people are looking for relationships. Folks, if we're going to tear down the walls, and there is a wall between where the fish are and where the fishermen are. Those people who had nothing to do with the church. If we're going to tear down those walls, then we've got to start building bridges out there to them. And we build bridges by cultivating relationships. And that might mean that we need to prioritize or restructure some things in our lives. Because there's people out there. We acknowledge they're fish. We acknowledge they're lost fish. But we're just saying, you know, they're lost. Not doing anything to cultivate a relationship uh, to, to bring them in. And for that to really happen, I think there has to be a real change in attitude in people's lives. There has to be a burden for lost souls. There has to be a concern for people that won't spend eternity with us. And what makes it worse is we never even threw a hook out there and baited it with the good news of Jesus Christ. But we also must invest ourselves in building friendships. When you look at this passage right here, you see Andrew went immediately to his family, and then Philip went immediately to a friend, Nathaniel. Let's look at verse 45 right there. And we see where one of them started at home and one of them started with his next door neighbor. Philip found Nathaniel and said to him, we have found him, you know, the one whom Moses 
uh, in the law had talked about, the one who the prophets had written about, you know, Jesus of Nazareth, the son of Joseph. We have found him. Now, when I look at that, I notice that both of them started with people that they knew. And they cultivated relationships with them. When I study this passage, I think I'm right in this understanding. Just a day or two before, Philip and Nathaniel had one thing in common. Neither one knew who Jesus Christ was. Now one did, and then the other did not. And then it got to the point that one man who was formerly a sinner who had now become a follower, goes to a man who's still a sinner, hooks the bait, brings him in, and they both become fishers of men. For a few days before, they were just fish out there. But Jesus got a lot of criticism in his ministry. He didn't get any criticism any more from anyone else than he did the Pharisees. And what was their biggest complaint against Jesus? He's a friend of sinners. See who that guy is. He's a friend of sinners. Folks, I, I hope you'll be a friend of sinners. I, I hope that you'll just get to know some sinners out there. Sinners that are not saved by grace. Okay, we're all sinners. But that's what we need to be. We need to be friends to sinners. Now notice that these didn't just hang around with these sinners on an occasional basis. He initiated contact with them. He was out there building relationships with them. It was important to him to spend time with them. See, Jesus understood that the greatest investment that we will ever make, it's not in stocks and bonds and gold and silver and all those things. It may or may not be important to you, but the greatest investment that we will ever make is the investment that we place on somebody's life on somebody's soul. Because all of those tangible things one day will be gone. But our souls will live on somewhere. So I want to encourage you folks. I want you to buddy up with Jesus. I want you to become a fishing buddy with Jesus, to be a fishing buddy for Jesus. And we do that by building relationships with people. And we might have to make some changes on our calendars. I saw a, a skit. I wasn't there, but um, I saw the filming of it. A skit that a church had in one of its services. And one person played an unchurched man that was invited to the church by a Christian co-worker. He came to the service. He enjoyed the service. He enjoyed the preaching. The preacher had a good message. And he had some questions. And some questions that rightly deserved some answers. But as the church service was over and they were standing outside the church, the unbeliever said to his Christian friend, you know, I, I liked what I saw today, but I do have some questions. And, and I'd like to have uh, some of those questions answered. So that Christian friend said, okay, let me look at my calendar. So he gets his calendar out and he says, well, well Monday, Monday I've got to go make a visit over uh, uh, at, at, at the nursing home. Tuesday, I've got to go over to the hospital and see somebody over there. Wednesday, well, Wednesday, you know I've got Bible study there. Thursday, well, Thursday I've got church choir practice. Friday I'm going to dinner with somebody in my Sunday school class. And then on Saturday, uh, then I'm going to be going to King's Island uh, with some people from church. And then Sunday, well, uh, here I am back again. He said, okay. The unbeliever said, okay, what about the following week? Well, he went through the following week basically saying the same thing. And then finally that unbeliever looks out at the audience and he said, why won't somebody invite me to go out with them to eat? And then the 
audience. Lights darken. And it gets people to think about. Something to think about. See, we can make all kinds of excuses. We can talk a good talk. Man, there's a lot of fish out there that need to be reached. But we're not doing a whole lot about bringing them in. And I think one of the best ways to do that, folks, is developing relationships. And this leads me to my final point here. We need to invite others in extending that fellowship. Did you notice here in this passage here that both Jesus and Philip brought people into the spiritual beginnings, into that spiritual fellowship? Because both of them said, come and see. Come and see. You're asking, you come, you see. You know the number one reason unchurched people start going to church? You know the number one reason church people, unchurched people start coming to church is because of a consistent encouragement of a trusted friend. That's a powerful statement. Consistent encouragement of a trusted friend. More than anything else, that will cause them to seek out. Come and see. Come and see what the church has to offer. And let's be honest, I talk with a lot of preachers in a year's time. Hear a lot of stories about things going on. But when people walk into a church, they don't want to hear fussing. They don't want to hear arguing. And they don't want to hear gossiping. And they don't want to hear complaining. They don't want to hear that negative talk. And I think we're very blessed there. I don't see a lot of that here, okay? But I know that it can happen, and it does happen. But what else I see is when those people that come into the church see the love of Christ radiated through the people in that fellowship, the more they want to be a part of that. Now I have said here for some 33 years, God is up for something good around here. He really is. You can stand right here with a fishing pole in your hand. Talk about God is up to something good. But we just stay here. We don't throw out that line. We don't bait it right. We won't be fishing. Let's pray.